if you have one transmitter in the room, you're not going to die. If you have a thousand, I'd be worry, worry. So turn them off. By simply turning off within your environment, you're reducing much of the dangers potentially to your body. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. For the past three years, I've been really into red light therapy because I've learned through doing this podcast how important natural light is for your body and your health in general. There's a reason why Juve is the number one red light therapy brand in the world. Their devices are sleek, powerful, they're FDA cleared, and they come in a bunch of different sizes. So you can set them up just about anywhere. I've got one here in my studio that I use when I'm on a break. I have the full elite unit in front of a vibe plate. Uh, next to my sauna, up in the Zen Den in the backyard. And I even have the little Juve Go travel model that I use to uh, regulate my sleep and things like that when I'm on the road. It's actually the single easiest health intervention I do and has some of the biggest results. Now, newer research is also showing red light therapy is great for improving women's hormone health, like thyroid regulation. It's done great things for my testosterone, but it's also really good for women, which is cool. Now, how does one therapy have all of these benefits? It's super simple. Our cells actually crave natural light to do their job. And when you give your body the light it needs, everything just works better. So if you're trying to improve your skin, hormones, reduce pain, get better sleep, red light therapy with the Juve is a great long-term investment. To check these out for yourself, super easy. Head over to juve.com forward slash Luke. That's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash Luke. Using that link, you're going to get a special bonus from the Juve team. They're giving away to all my listeners. And there you can find all the research and dig into the data yourself and see that this is so legit. I also like it because it's a therapy you can do while you're doing different things. So I'll lift weights, I'll stretch, I'll shake around on the vibe plate, I'll listen to music. I do all kinds of weird stuff standing in front of my Juve. So it's great. Get to juve.com forward slash Luke. One of the most common questions we get here at the show is everyone wants to know what's the best nootropic and more importantly, what's the one that's effective but also safe? Well, that's where our sponsor, naturalstacks.com forward slash Luke comes in. They've got an amazing product called NeuroFuel. You might be familiar with it when it was called Siltep. Well, now it's called NeuroFuel. But more importantly, it's got a much lower price. That's the good news for you. And they renamed it NeuroFuel because it actually acts as fuel for your neurotransmitters and supports synaptic connectivity. That means more signaling between your brain cells, and that means more brain power. Now, I love to take this stuff before interviews, before I record my promos like this, if I have to write a bit of copy. Anything that requires concentration, memory productivity, focus, like when I really need to sit down and work on something. But oftentimes too, I'll just take it on the plane if, I'm, if I know I'm going to be groggy when I land or something like that. So this is just a really good, well-rounded nootropic stack. It's from naturalstacks.com forward slash Luke. However, heads up when you get over there, pick up some of my favorite magnesium product on the market. It's called MagTech. They have tons of other great stuff too. And what I love about this company is they have full transparency. You can see every single ingredient in every single product, where it comes from and what it does. So these guys are just a really legit supplement company. So that's naturalstacks.com forward slash Luke. And the product you want to start with is called NeuroFuel, very safe and effective nootropic. Then I'd grab yourself some of that MagTech magnesium. Those are two really good products to start with. And then from there, start exploring their entire menu. That's naturalstacks.com slash Luke. You can save 15% off over there by using the code Luke Story. The code is Luke Story at naturalstacks.com forward slash Luke. Right about now would be a good time to congratulate yourself because you made it to yet another episode of the Lifestylist podcast. And today's show covers a very hot topic and one that's been quite popular over the past three and a half years of producing the show. And that is EMFs. 
Today, we're going to be talking about EMFs in a very specific way, though, so stay tuned for more information on today's episode. But before we get into that, I'd like to invite you to a couple events. Please note that due to the coronavirus travel restrictions, many of my upcoming events have rescheduled. At the time of this recording, we've got Paleo FX in Austin, July 14th through 16th. We've got Upgrade Labs Biohacking Conference in Beverly Hills, July 24th through 26th. Then we've got Meet Delic in LA, August 8th and 9th, and the Health Optimization Summit in London, September 12th and 13th. I'll also be heading back to one of my favorite places on earth, Quixmala in Mexico, June 17th through 24th for the Healing Power of Energy Retreat, where I'll be documenting my experience there via live stream and also recording some podcasts that whole week. So those are the dates for now, but always make sure to visit lukestory.com forward slash events for up to the minute reports on any changes that might take place. That's lukestory.com forward slash events. See you there. Also, by the end of this episode, I'm guessing you're going to want to get your hands on some EMF protection devices from our guest company. It's called Defender Shield, and this is what I use on my cell phone. In fact, those of you watching on Instagram right now will get a demo. This is a radiation-proof cell phone case uh, that also serves as a little mini wallet, which at first I found kind of difficult because I'm so used to having a wallet and a phone. But now you could not pay me to carry my wallet. I have my two key credit cards, my ID, and uh, just close my phone up in there and I'm protected. I don't always have to put it on airplane mode when it's in my pocket. I know what side to face it to protect myself and my nads from getting fried by radiation. So uh, if you want to get your hands on one of these phone cases or one of their great laptop shields or the various products that they make, actually one of the cool things they make is a little fanny pack you can keep your phone and stuff in. Uh, I don't wear fanny packs, but I know my friend Kyle Kingsbury does, and I got to remember to get him one of these as a gift. Uh, and you can keep all your stuff in there. And it not only protects against uh, the radiation from hitting your body, but it also protects from people in airports and things like that, stealing your data, including those dirty pictures you have on your phone. You know what I'm saying? That happens to people. That's where they get those celebrity photos I found out, which is really interesting. There's people that have these uh, RFID readers and they can just blast through your pocket or purse and get your data. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, check out DefenderShield.com. Our guest, Daniel, has given you guys a 20% discount. I always try to get a discount if a guest is going to come on and inadvertently slang their stuff by talking about their expertise and products, et cetera. So go to DefenderShield.com. The 20% off code is Lifestylist. And you can get yourself a phone case, a laptop shield, whatever. Daniel DeBond's concern regarding the health impact of EMF emissions grew from over 30 years of engineering experience in the telecommunication industry, where he had a variety of different executive positions at Telecordia, AT&T, and Bell Labs. He's also the co-author of Radiation Nation, The Fallout of Modern Technology, which, by the way, is a really simple, straightforward book on EMF. So I recommend that you get that if you want to learn more. But you're going to learn a hell of a lot of information today. And this show really centers mostly around our issues with devices. So we don't talk so much about um, EMFs as a global issue, the 5G pandemic and all of those things. But it's really how to use your technology safely. You know, how to have a phone, a laptop, all these things in your house and uh, get the benefits of them without getting fried by them. So we talk about what EMF radiation is, all the different types, what it does to you why the current safety standards for EMF are vastly insufficient, the difference between 5G cell tower networks and the 5G you see on your Wi-Fi router. Um, spoiler alert, it's not the same thing, but you need to know why now. We cover the EMF sources of greatest concern, so laptops in all different directions, including the keyboard, desktop computers, the Bluetooth trackpads, wireless keyboards, the EMF from laptops and phones plugged in versus running on battery, how to protect yourself from bedside tech devices, why you should never, ever use Bluetooth headsets or Bluetooth anything on your head, which part of the phone has the worst EMF levels. Uh, we poise whether or not those harmonizing stickers and other things you put on your phone actually work. How to protect yourselves and especially your kids from EMF radiation inside the home coming from various technologies like smart appliances, etc. And really how to not be paranoid and poison yourself with adrenaline and cortisol. So this is one of those delicate balance topics where you want to build awareness, but not be in freak out mode. And so Daniel really gives us some tools to create balance emotionally and mentally so that we can protect ourselves, but not run around in a state of paranoia. 
We also talk about a couple of very interesting and uh, kind of terrifying studies, to be honest. Uh, one in which males used laptops for only a few hours and showed reduced sperm count. Uh, also one where women uh, who place cell phones in their bras developed tumors in their breast. Also regular cell phone users who have developed rare forms of brain tumors. And the alarming number of children aged six months to four years that use mobile devices most of them starting before the age of one. So we really want to look out for the kids, you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of talk about this in the episode. Before we get into the interview, I want to invite you to join my newsletter and make an exciting announcement. Uh, We just launched a few weeks ago, and you might have noticed this, updated show notes and transcripts. So the show notes used to just kind of have the bullet points of everything that I talked about with our guests. Now we have timestamps. So at six minutes, 47 seconds, Luke and Daniel talk about cell phone next to your bed, et cetera. The uh, notes are very thorough. There's tons of links in them. And then also transcripts of every single word spoken, uh, just literally transcripts. Um, And you can find those at lukestory.com. So you won't be emailed the transcripts, but you're going to get these badass new super buff show notes. So get on the newsletter by going to lukestory.com forward slash newsletter. Just open up your browser right now on your phone. Go to lukestory.com forward slash newsletter. I'm waiting for you. Okay. Do, 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 do. You can still hear my voice, right? LukeStory.com forward slash newsletter. Enter your name and email. And I promise not to send you a bunch of weird emails all the time. I basically just send you the show notes every Tuesday and sometimes a Friday when I do a bonus show. If you don't want to do the browser version of getting on the list, you can just text me. Text the word lifestylist, all one word, lifestylist to the number 44222. So text lifestylist to 44222, and that gets you on the newsletter and on these new badass show notes as well. All right. That being said, let's jump off into this episode now and learn how to safely enjoy the technology we've grown to love and depend on with our guest, Daniel Debon. Daniel, welcome to the show, dude. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Luke, I appreciate you giving me a call back and following up from the last time we talked. <laughs> yeah, me too. So it was one of the best podcasts I ever did. <laughs> second time's a charm. We can only hope. And what he's referring to, those of you listening to the podcast, is we recorded about a month ago, and we we went for like an hour and a half, man, and we covered everything you could ever want to know about EMFs as they pertain to your personal devices, etc. And we were both like, yes, like doing the virtual high five afterward. And then <laughs> when I went to download the files, um, which I do a backup, that's what's funny. I do the video on Skype and then I have an app called Zencaster, which captures the audio and, and all four files, because there's two files, you know, there's two people. So there's two files. All four files were corrupt and unlistenable. <laughs> so <laughs> I sent them to my my producers at Crate Media and I was like, can you guys salvage this? And they're like, honestly, <laughs> it's not even listenable to us. And, you know, so the audience would never approve of this. So, you know, that was a trial run. We're going to do it again. And, you know, maybe we can, um, we might even be more focused today having given it a second shot. <laughs> well, thanks so much for inviting me again, Luke. I appreciate it. I'm stoked, man. It. I'm stoked because EMFs in general are a topic that I'm really excited to share information about. And more so specifically, what we're going to be covering, of course, is I mean, we're going to dip dip into some different areas of EMF, but essentially, you know, how they relate to our devices, because I think that's the thing that we have a really hard time getting away from. Um, if you yeah. find that you're living next to a cell tower or you've got a you know wall of smart meters on your house, you have the ability to move away from that to some degree. Right, but right. I don't think any of us are willing to not have a laptop or a cell phone or a tablet or something so... I've been kind of like struggling with, well, how do I keep my devices and use this technology uh, without, you know, harming myself? So I'm stoked. Um, So you've been in the game uh, for a long, long time now. You've written a book, which is a really great, simple read for those listening called Radiation Nation, The Fallout of Modern Technology. And I'm just, if you could give me like the truncated version of how you got into the industry of EMF protection in the first place. What's your background? Sure. Um, uh, For 20 years or so, I ran the technical laboratories for the Bell System and electronics. Uh, uh, All the infrastructure used to communicate 
phone calls for all these years. I ran technical laboratories for this stuff. So I had a lot of background in from Bell Labs and subsequent companies that do that work. And, um, oh, seven years ago or so, my, my sons were visiting. They're dull men. And they were typing away on their laptops for hours at a time. And my wife says to me, that can't be good for them. That's electronic stuff that's close and I want grandchildren, this can't be good. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. This is low level energy. There's no way this is ever gonna hurt you. But I said, okay, let me look into it a little bit. So I looked onto the medical side, the research side of, of this stuff, which is quite a lot and been going on for since the 60s, 70s. And I found that even back then, we knew that after about three or four hours, 25% of the male sperm is immobile. So it definitely affects the body. And as you pointed out, you're not gonna throw your technology away. Neither are my boys. So I said, well, look, what can I do? And I said, well, I can shield it. I can stop the signals that are closest to the body. And by doing that, I remove most of the harm, potentially from those transmissions. So I built a prototype, because I'm a mechanical engineer as well, and I so I built a prototype for them. Their friends liked it, so I built a couple of more for their friends, and then it became a nightmare. I, I kept on going with this, yeah, <laughs> and building more and more products that are designed to fix the stuff you don't want to throw away from protecting you when you use it. Right. So, can you describe the the different types of EMF that we're dealing with when it comes to devices? Because uh, you know, I think a lot of people just think it's the the RF that's you know the signal that's coming from our phone or our laptop using Wi Fi. But there's a few other things that these devices oh, can yeah. also be emitting. <clears throat> so, Luke, when when you were talking about at the introduction, you mentioned something about smart meters. And you were saying, well, like, you know, we can find ways of fixing that. Well, there's two aspects of a smart media you worry about. The RF, the radio frequency signal, and then there's also the extremely low frequency signal. The byproduct of electronic running through the wires is 60 hertz uh, emissions that are coming out of your walls. It's coming out of your um, your microwave oven, your your toaster, your your hair dryer. There's emissions coming out of that. When you're really close to that stuff, that is as dangerous as radio frequency stuff. But it's different because it's a different spectrum. Um, radio frequency, as as you may remember, is typically around two gigahertz. The ELF is around 60 hertz. So it's much, much lower, but it still can interfere with the body. Um, and so those fundamentally do different things. It's also true that with RF, most, many people don't realize, it's a microwave signal. In other words, your microwave operates at 2.3 gigahertz. Your cell phone is about two gigahertz. They're almost the same thing. But guess what? It's still a microwave signal. It's a thermal emitting signal that can damage the body. So those are the two different types we worry about. I remember a few years ago when I first started going down the rabbit hole with EMFs and stuff, there were these videos. They, they're probably still on there and guys write in my show notes if you can find these videos. They're fascinating. But there was one in particular where they took uh, a, a, an egg and they put an egg on a little pedestal and then they put two cell phones calling each other on either side of the egg and it cooked the freaking egg. Yeah, right. Actually. Have you seen that? Yeah, the, uh, that's because it's a, a thermal limiting signal. That's why. In fact, with the cell phone, they restrict the amplitude of the signal so it doesn't fry the center of your, your brain. But guess what? As an adult like you, it maybe goes in one inch and it heats up the cells around your head as much as two degrees. If you're a child, it goes completely through your head doing the same thing. It's heating up the cells, but more importantly, there's a lot of biological impacts to that as well. 
And then, and it, um, and I'm assuming it's worse for kids because their skull is so much yeah. thinner, right? Yeah, the, the soft tissue. The softer it is, the more susceptible it is. So, it's kids, very very young kids. They're like three, four, five times as um, it's danger three or four, five times more dangerous for them to use it than it is for an adult male. Yeah, I, I always kind of cringe, you know, when I see um, a well-meaning parent with, with their kid with a tablet or an iPhone or something that's sitting on their yeah. lap or they have it up in their face. It's like so tempting to politely say, hey, you might not be aware of this, but yeah. there's some facts. You know, it's funny. Um I've told this story so many times on my podcast, so regular listeners, forgive me for flogging a dead horse here, but uh, I'm, I've been so EMF aware because of seeing videos like the egg getting fried. From that point on, I, I use a speakerphone. I mean, I don't think I've ever put my phone to my head, except maybe in getting an Uber at the airport or like in an emergency situation where I couldn't use speakerphone. Um, now I can because I've got your Defender Shield. So if right. it gets loud, I do. But still, I tend to use the speakerphone. But um, when I started becoming aware of this, unknowingly, I was living in an apartment in um, here in L.A. that was about 100 yards across from two giant cell towers. Uh, wow. The multi-tower ones. But they were hidden by this sort of facade of a wall. And I was living there for three years and I started having all of these horrific symptoms. My eyes went bad. I started having to wear glasses, uh, just incredible brain fog to the point where, some, I mean, sometimes I just couldn't even work. I'd have wow. interviews like this and I'd really, people didn't know, but I was struggling to even put a sentence together and um, woke up with severe headaches every day, just, you know, on and on, got colds and flus, which I, I haven't, you know, I've been healthy for so long. I haven't, there's, there was years where I didn't get a cold or a flu. Anyway, I had all these symptoms and then eventually I figured out uh, by investigating the building across the street accidentally or not, maybe perhaps it was the unseen hand um, that was guiding me over there to see it. But I instant, you know, instantly started looking for a place to live and I moved into this house, which is in the hills and has, um, you know, no cell service, which is, you know, has its own challenges that I found out. But anyway, what I did is when I moved out, you know, I emailed the other three tenants in that fourplex and, and I said, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to be a tinfoil hat guy here and I, I don't want to instill fear in you, but I would be remiss to not let you know why I just suddenly moved out and you yeah. know, take the information and do with it what you will. But I sent them a photograph of our building, including those two cell towers with a couple of arrows pointing to where they were. Uh, and then links to a few studies and videos and stuff. And I said, hey, just just so you're aware, you know, uh, some people are more sensitive than others. I think I'm one of those. And not one of them emailed me back, you know. <laughs> and so I was like, well, at least I did did my job. And then the lady that moved in after me, um, she started getting my mail. And I thought, well, I could send her that email. I said, you know what? It's like, it's none of my business. Um, I don't want to freak people out. None of the other tenants answered my email. So maybe this is just my thing. Yeah. But, um, a couple of days ago, anyway, she found another package for me and I moved out almost a year ago and I thought, God, what a sweet lady, you know, she could just throw them in the garbage. But she emails me and says, hey, there's a package here on the porch. So I sent her that email and I just said, hey, you know, not trying to be weird here, but I thought you should know. And she emailed back and she was like, yeah, I'm very aware of EMS, but you know what? I like living in the city and I don't care. Right. And right. so it's like... You know, those type of situations um, help me to realize it's not my job to go around and be the EMF police. Even when I see a kid right. with a cell phone on their head, it's like that's their karma, their journey. And I guess my work is interviewing people like you and building awareness without instilling fear. And so that brings me to right. kind of my next my next question, just on the psychological front, if if we're if we're knowing that women that um, keep cell phones in their bras, get breast cancer in short order, and men, their sperm gets immobilized from having a laptop on their junk and all of this. Um, you know, where's the fine line between awareness and walking around with anxiety and fear about these things being in our environment? So when we talk about these devices, there's a lot of different ways you can minimize dangers, very simple things. And we're going to get more detail about those kinds of things. Um, the simple things you can do that eliminates much of the concerns. Um, but but there were some very important things you were mentioning. You had um, fog, foggy thinking. You maybe had headaches. Um, those are 
electromagnetic radiation hypersensitivity responses to exposures. Um, you're a, a, a canary in the coal mine to some extent. There's over 20% of the population that we know is hypersensitive. Uh, yours is a little bit more than the average, but it can get extremely worse in time. So hypersensitivity is a really sort of big deal when you talk about this stuff, even more so than the linkage of cancer related to these kinds of things. Like for example, uh, frontal lobe cancer has increased 2% over the last 10 years, compounding over 10 years, frontal lobe. Well, that's what you would expect to see because that's the surface part of the, the brain tissue that is most impacted by a cell phone. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But in general, you're really more worried about your stuff than you are worried about cancer in a sense because it's debilitating and it can be extremely debilitating. And so... Um, when you have a cancer description of a, a cell phone on a breast, for example, there's virtually no question about it. There's a direct correlation to the cancer in the breast from the transmitting cell phone. If you're a woman in the first trimester out of San, uh, San Francisco a couple of years ago, they gave RF meters to a bunch of women in their first trimester. And what they found was the high levels of exposure, those who were in the high level of exposure were three times more likely to have miscarriage. And so the, there is no doubt under high long-term exposure periods, there can be pretty serious consequences. But in the, and we know that there are clear scientific evidence, replicated evidence through multiple studies, well-written studies, well, uh, structured studies that show pretty serious damaging uh, long-term exposure kind of conditions. In terms of the regulatory agencies that implement safety standards, give us a bit of background on you know what when the laws were created and how they're so terribly outdated. You know, I don't I don't know the data on that, but I've heard you talk about that before. It's like you know, we're going off cell phone studies from 1973 or so, you know, it's like, it, right. it's, it seems to be that there's, it's kind of a, a fox in the hen house situation where you have similar to, you have like a, at the FDA, you have ex heads of Monsanto, oh, yeah. and, you know, there's all this pay for play uh, kind of funky stuff going on. So what's going on with the FC, uh, FCC or other regulatory agencies that should be protecting the populace, but are not because they're perhaps in bed with some of the tech companies, et cetera. Right. So, so um, I'll refer to, I'll start off by talking a little bit about the standard. Over 30 years ago, cell phones came out and the standard was based on six foot males that occasionally use a cell phone. And the standard was established that the strength of the signal can't be more than 1.6 watts per kilogram because they knew a six foot male would have that signal penetrate the skull by one inch and heat up the area by two degrees. I often tell the story that 30 years ago, I'd had a cell phone, but I had no one to talk to because no one else had a cell phone. <laughs> it'd be so occasional use back then was very, very so often and very, very short because you couldn't afford the minutes on your cell phone. Um, fast forward today, that standard, which by the way, that standard was only concerned with the thermal impact, the heating up. Everything you were talking about before was a biological response, which is far more, as we now understand it, far more dangerous than any thermal impact could ever be from these kinds of transmissions. So, is, so there, is there no is there no regulation then for the radiation that's going into your head or your private there parts is none. from using these devices? It's just about like putting a hot thing against your head, right? Literally, oh, that's and, so and, insane. And, 
I'll break it into more detail, which I hate to do, but, you know, a standard six foot male, if he had um, a concussion and had a blood brain barrier breakdown, that's no longer true. The cell phone will go to the center of the brain, the frontal lobe. So if there are certain body conditions that you have, it can be worse. So, so that was when the standard was. It only talked about thermal, and it's been never updated over these many, many years. Uh, recently, um, the FCC approved 5G, which is the fifth generation technology, which, by the way, is fundamentally different than the standard when it became 30 years ago established in the marketplace. It, is, it was not a, a sine wave signal. It was now 5G, a digital signal that didn't work at two gigahertz. Two gigahertz, by the way, is two billion cycles per second. And the 5G can work up to 300 billion cycles per second. So all of a sudden, the standard has virtually nothing to do with the current technology that we are in, 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 uh, integrating into our, in our devices. And sort of the fox in the hen house that you were referring to is uh, 20, 30 years ago, I actually worked in the industry for a long time, as you know. And there was a guy named Tom Wheeler who was the head of the CTIA, a consortium specifically lobbying the federal government for the service providers, the cell phone service providers. And he had that job for 10, 15 years. And five, six, no, actually about seven years ago, he was appointed as the chairman of the FCC. And as the chairman of the FCC, he had 5G standards introduced to his organization to be approved or disapproved. And so here we have the guy that represented the cell phone industry making a decision about a technology. And his decision was, we don't have to test this. We don't have to make sure it's safe. We have to make sure we deploy it really quickly. And so here we go. We have up to 300 gigahertz of signal that's being transmitted from at the front of your house. And it's not been tested. The standard for rep, uh, present, presenting safety for the user hasn't been reviewed for 30 some odd years. And that's what's being deployed with 5G today. And what's the difference between the 5G millimeter wave and the, the you know, 2G, 3G, 4G that we've been using and sort of progressing through? Like, what's the difference of the biological effects? Because there's so much noise within the health community about the dangers of there 5G, is. even above and beyond regular exposure. So being near you know, in a smart grid kind of city as they call it. I love that they call it smart too, because it's so dumb. But um, being, you know, close to a 5G transmitter, why is that worse than being near a regular cell tower? So there, there are a lot of reasons for that. And, but but uh, let me talk about why is this so much different than previously? Um, when we spoke about, uh, spoke about ELF, extremely low frequency at 60 hertz, that's really, really, really low on the spectrum scale, on the left-hand side of the spectrum scale. And when we talk about microwaves, we talk about it a little above the left-hand side of the scale. So it's not much farther. Two gigahertz from, from uh, 60 hertz sounds like a lot, but it's really not too much. We're talking about almost approaching x-ray speeds, which are in the terahertz space. And, and so it's very, very fundamentally different because now you're at so much faster speeds. And by the way, um, when the standard was created long ago, they weren't a pulsing signal. When the standard was created, it was on a, a constant load signal. Now it's pulsing signals. 
Pulsing actually is more damaging to the cell than a constant load to a cell. So there's a little bit of mechanical breakdown of the cell that happens more with this. Um, but with 5G, as you increase the speeds, this isn't a nanometer. It's just a continuation of speeds. Uh, it's going much more fast, not quite as fast as X-ray, but it's getting there. As, as uh, time goes on, it'll actually get up to that point. But so you're here, you go, you're increasing it, and then you're asking me, what's the impact? No one knows. There's been literally no study work. And as a research scientist, you don't speculate. However, I can give you some idea what potentially can occur. We don't know. But bugs like to propagate in uh, faster speeds. The gut, for example. The good gut, the bad gut, it propagates better in higher speeds than up to 4G. So when you go to 5G, oh, it's almost a different game. It's a different ball card. But but there was an, another really important point you were making before. You were you were within a thousand feet of a cell tower. That was a 60 watt cell tower transmission, 60 watts. And so there was a lot of power that was coming down. It wasn't one watt. It was by the time it was hitting you, maybe at 30 watts, half the watt. What is limit? So you had a fairly strong signal. With 5G, you can only go 750 feet, not the four or five miles of 4G. Why? Because the speeds are faster and the and the load drops down really, really fast. So it's really short distance. But guess what? It's at 20, uh, it's 20 watts being transmitted at what is referred to the small tower, the small uh, cell. It's it's a third of what a standard cell tower. And what I wanted to mention before, it's the amplitude of the signal where you are three times more likely within a thousand feet of a cell tower to get cancer than the average population. And so would I speculate? Do I know what the problem is going to be with the small cell, cell tower distance? I, I can't. But I know from research that the closer you are to a higher power level signal, the more likely you are susceptible to biological uh, changes to your body. I'll give you a story about that. I work with a neurologist. He called me up on a Saturday morning and he said, my head hurts, my head hurts. I'm saying, well, how do I know what's going on with your head? And, and I said, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, I just moved into a place and I have, uh, you know, I'm in a cabin somewhere, and I just got new cable service. And I said, did you get a coaxial cable, or did you have a wireless service? And he said, how did you know? I have a wireless service. I said, oh, chances are you have 5G. His heart was hurting so bad because of that 5G signal that he was a canary in the coal mine. He immediately felt it when he was so close to the towers. So I think there's enough projection of concern from historical evidence of prop body response up to 4G, where we really should be concerned even more so with 5G. Something I find um, terribly disconcerting about the 5G wavelength is, well, A, is is millimeter waves not the technology they use in those relatively new TSA airport scanners? <clears throat> no, it's even worse than that. Because I, I don't go, I don't use those. I have TSA pre-check and I go through the old school, uh, you know, metal detector. And if there's not one of those, I'll get the pat down. I'm like, you guys can take me in the room and do whatever you want with me. <laughs> like, I'm not walking through the millimeter wave. That's like a little 5G. It is, coffin, it is. You know? But worse than that, you and I are in the university. We're going to go... We're going to go complain about something, and all of a sudden the army truck comes up and it, and it directs a signal to us, and it's a active device intended to break up crowds, and it's at 90 gigahertz. Remember, microwave signals go up to 300 gigahertz. Wi-Fi goes up to 300 gigahertz. So we know at 90 gigahertz, they use it in crowd control. 
It's not water, power water. It's used for crowd control. And what's actually happening there, by the way, when you have uh, sweat glands, they're little coils in the, underneath the skin. And when they put the 90 gigahertz signal towards you, it acts as an antenna and it draws the antenna in. That's why you get so hot. That's why you run. So we know in some of the spectrum, it can be pretty seriously dangerous to you. In fact, you will run from it. And that's active denial uh, that's used today in, uh, in armies and there, yeah, crowd control. I, there are videos, um, and hopefully these can make it in the show notes as, show notes as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting, though, because information like this is now being quickly censored from YouTube. So I implore someone, you know, start creating other platforms where information like this can be shared. But I have seen videos of them demonstrating the military applications of the yeah. millimeter wave, aka yeah. 5G range. And essentially what you're describing is they have a tank and rather than a water gun or <laughs> or bullets or, you know, yeah. um, those bean bags or any of that, it's just, it's an invisible wave. And then you see people just start screaming and crying right. and running right. away. I mean, right. they show that they show it being tested and it's like, oh, you're going to move into a neighborhood that is actively firing those same signals toward your house or your office. I mean, it's just, it's just nuts, you know? Yeah. Um, one other thing that I find confusing about the 5G thing, and I, I meant to kind of stick to devices, but this is such a, it's such a hot conversation right now and one that I think is so important, but um, myself and people that write into the show and follow me on social media have a really difficult time discerning which of these new towers are 5G because the old cell towers are, you know, like these panels that are maybe three feet tall and, you know, right. 10 inches wide, right? And there'll be a bunch of little sticks up on a pole, you know, that's kind of the classic, maybe the 4G cell towers. And then in LA, we have now, especially in the canyons, like in Malibu and Topanga Canyon here in Laurel Canyon, where there's mountains that prevent cell towers four or five miles away from getting into the canyon. They have these little short dogs hanging off the phone poles in both directions, you know, facing, in other words, both directions of the road. And there'll be every every single or every other phone pole will have these. And they're maybe 16, 20 inches high and eight inches wide, you know, these small cells. And I always thought that those were 5G. And then I had my friend Brian Hoyer, who has uh, RF meters that are specially designed. Actually, they're used by the telecommunications companies. And they go up to, I think, uh, 30 gigahertz. So they can test kind of at the bottom range of what 5G would be. We went out and tested those, and they were, were getting no signals. Uh, we were getting, you know, within the normal range of 4G. And so I don't think those are, because a lot of people will send pictures to me on Instagram and be like, is this 5G? I go, I don't think it is actually. But now we have these little cylinders. They're like, they look like a giant soup can and they're white and there's nothing else on them except that. And I suspect that those might be the 5G ones. So is there is there any way to identify visually what a 5G cell tower looks like versus one of the uh, the older ones? The height. Literally, the height of the what the, of the stuff you see, when you see it at the very top of um, of a telephone pole, that's possibly um, it's a small cell site. It's 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 a traditional four G cell site, um, but when it's lower, it's highly likely to be five G because they can only go seven hundred and fifty feet, and that means they don't worry about going over the hill. They worry about only getting to your house. So the lower it is, the more direct it is. And so when you see the lower uh, units, that's more likely to. And by the way, they can convert as well. They can show as 4, 4G transmissions, but they can convert them to 5G. Um, oh, interesting. But you'll see now, if there's a new installation, it's more likely than not 5G. Because of the cable service pro the, of telephone providers are not spending money on any traditional technologies. It's all the new stuff. Well, here's what's weird in LA when I see these these new uh, strange looking cell towers that'll be on the top of like a lamppost, for example, right in the middle of Hollywood. Right. Um, what's strange is you'll just see one and there aren't any others around in many cases. Like you just see one on one street. So that would indicate to me that that's probably not 5G because if that one little tower only goes 750 feet, they would need to have them going up and down the whole street for them to do anything, right? I mean, yeah, right. So, so Luke, 
we, we've been talking up to 300 gigahertz, right? Yeah. Um, in 5G, there's actually four or five different signal levels around the um, three to five gigahertz range, even down to 900 megahertz. It's depending on the application. 5G talks about a, a whole network, a whole new network, and there's a bunch of parts to it. And one part may act as an intermediary with other parts of it, and they interconnect. And that's this web of stuff, transmission stuff, is all controlled by control stuff above it all. So when you see these new stuff going in, they may be actually in the lower range. Um, and that lower range is not as concerning as the really high range, which is only in the small cell. Got it's it. the stuff only in front of a house that would likely be 5G. Okay. That you worry about. Got it. And another strange thing about this rollout, because the 5G rollout is so shrouded in mystery, there's not a lot of public no. knowledge being shared by the telecommunications companies because they're about profit, not about informing yeah. the public of safety precautions. Yeah. Uh, but another thing that's interesting is some people's phones in different towns and cities will pop up. And when you look at your phone and the service you're getting, like right now, I think, let me see what mine says. Um, oh, mine, I don't get service at my house. That's right. Uh, it's, <laughs> I'm on, I'm on Wi-Fi on my phone. But, you know, your phone will usually say 3G, 4G, something like that. Yeah. I notice if I go to a less developed country like Costa Rica, my phone always drops down to 3G. And there's an indicator on the top of your iPhone that tells right. you what network and many people now have phones that are popping up as 5G, but they're not in a 5G area and they're not near any visible 5G towers. Do you think that's like a test that the different <laughs> phone companies are rolling out to make your phone receptive to 5G, even though you're not in one of the networks yet? So, believe it or not, you didn't intentionally ask me this question, but it's a very good question. 5G will coexist with all the previous technologies for the foreseeable future. So when we talk about, as you just did, about it registers 3G or registers 4G, it will continue doing that because those transmissions will continue. And when you're picking up a 5G, it's possible, it's one of the intermediary transmissions and not the a small cell transmission, which you probably wouldn't see. Got um, so, and by the way, you, you probably didn't pick it up, but when I said 20 watts, no one knows that. That's sort of a pretty important point. When you talk to those who are talking about these problems, it's not a general well-known understood. It's 20 watts being transmitted at the front of your house. It's one third the power level of one that goes five miles. Wow. For 4G. Wow. That's a big deal, in my opinion. Yeah. Because I think that's what's going to bother you more than cancer to the brain, for example. You're going to feel that uh, more so than you do 4G. The, the next thing I'd like to clear up for people is uh, <laughs> the terminology that's used when we're Looking at our in-home Wi-Fi network, you have a Wi-Fi router that's transmitting radiation throughout your house and that radiation carries your data as mine is right now in my office um, so that I can use my cell phone and a laptop and the Sonos system and the Dyson heater and right, all right. the shit that runs on Wi-Fi, unfortunately. Right. But people seem very confused that um, if they're picking up a 5G signal from their router, they think that's the same thing as 5G cell service. So could you explain the difference between a Wi-Fi I, I, I number and the cell phone network that's out in the world on the towers and all that? Absolutely. Um, 5G that we all hear about these days is fifth generation. When we were talking about uh, ELF, we talked about it as Hertz. When we talked about up to 4G, about 2 gigahertz. That's the actual speed that's being transmitted from your cell phone to the cell tower. 
When you go and you talk about a router, it's at 2.4 gigahertz or 5.6 gigahertz. That's the actual speed of the transmission. It has nothing to do with fifth generation transmission. It only has to do with the speed of the transmission. Got it. So it's, Does that help? Yeah, so it's semantics. In other words, people yeah. just need to understand that when you're talking about the 5G rollout worldwide and smart grids and smart cities and this horrific <laughs> stuff that's that's being developed and released without any safety testing that many <laughs> communities and, and citizens are fighting against, that's a completely yeah. different thing than when you have your Wi-Fi in your house right. and you can set it to 2.4 or 5 well, gigahertz because right. it'll say 5G when you're picking up the signal in your house. So I just wanted people to understand that. Now, in your opinion, for those of us that have the option of running um, a Wi-Fi router in our house on 2.4 or 5, which do you think would be the safest? Because I can set mine to either one and it works the same. Uh, the speed seems the same. Uh, receptivity within the home seems the same, but I've heard different differing opinions on which one's more biologically harmful in those two uh, different wavelengths or signals in the home from your router. From a scientific medical point of view, there is no difference. And I can say that so definitively because there has never been research that clearly tests one against the other. So when you think of these things, you define it as no difference. So there is literally no biological difference that science knows about. Now you can speculate that it's possible that 2.4 is better than 5.6 because it's a less speed. But when you are at those low level speeds, there's appreciably very little, if any, difference at all to the cell itself. So I wouldn't do it. So it's more a question of, do you want your data faster or not? One's right. twice as fast as the other. That's it. <laughs> okay. Because I think my, if I'm not mistaken, I think mine's still on 2.4 and it's it seems to work fine. And Yeah, it does. I, I, I think... Ultimately, the solution when you're when you're dealing with your home, I mean, in a perfect world, this would be my strategy. I'll run this by you and just share this with the listeners. Um, I I lease the home that I'm in now, and I'm in the process of looking to buy my own house. Um, since I'm leasing, it doesn't make sense to spend twenty thousand dollars using shielding paint. Uh, you know, however, I mean, I'm, it might cost 50 grand to tear out all the wiring in the walls to shield all that, to do shielding paint, EMF curtains, in other words, to turn the whole home into a Faraday cage and then hardwire all the devices. So you have Ethernet ports in every room to plug in your phone, to plug in right. devices and things, which I think that's like the ultimate, the best harmonious, safe kind of home strategy. Uh, in this house I'm in, as I said, I don't have cell service, so I've got to have the Wi-Fi on. So my intermediate strategy is to uh, just have it on a timer and the Wi-Fi turns off around the time I go to bed every night and then turns back on in the morning. And then I also have a few devices around the house that have been very effective um, for my symptoms. One is called a Soma Vedic. I have a couple of those around the house and then I have these Blue Shield devices and um, it's definitely helped kind of harmonize the field. It doesn't block the EMF, but it absolutely improves sleep and gets rid of the headaches and some of the other symptoms I've experienced. Um, so shielding your whole home, hardwiring everything would be the most hardcore way to do it if you really wanted to be protected. And if you owned a place and you wanted to invest, you could do that. But for those of us that are renting or living in an apartment and don't have the, you know, the finances or the opportunity to kind of like biohack our whole property in that way, let's go ahead and move into some of the strategies of the various devices. And I want to talk about our cell phone, tablets and laptops uh, to see what we can do, because I know you make some great products that protect these, but I'd like to talk about specifically kind of the emissions that are coming off our devices generally. So um, we could start perhaps with with a laptop. Um, from what I understand, and like your Defender Shield pads go under the laptop. So mine is just Velcroed permanently to the bottom of my MacBook. And I just, that way, you know, I don't have to go grab it. It's just, it's on the airplane anywhere I am. So the radiation on the bottom, from what I understand, is 99% blocked or something. Um, what can we do about, 
you know, radiation or magnetic fields or electric fields coming off the actual keyboard, the trackpad, the screen, all of that on a laptop. Let's talk about those things. But I think what you just spoke about earlier is so important. This is not, you don't panic. You don't, you don't talk about how endangered you are from the technology around. You can take actions to do things. And I think you are pointing to some very, very solid ways of minimizing exposure. And that's what you do. The, f- the fact is, in your case, where you can, running an Ethernet cable to your devices, whatever devices you're using, is a simple thing. I have a laptop. It's always plugged into an Ethernet. I never use Wi-Fi for that. So I'm not transmitting Wi-Fi. I'm using cable, so I'm reducing the number of transmissions in the room. That's a very simple thing to do. The other thing you did is you put it on a timer. You took probably 50% of the real dangers and you put them away. You eliminated them from being a concern for your body by simply turning it off. The other thing you can very simply do is move it away from you. As you push it away from you, the more and more you push it away, the better off you are. So if you have a router next to your head and you're sitting on a desk, that's not a good thing. But you take that same router and you put it 10 feet away and much of the danger is gone. So by simply placing it away from you, you actually reduce the potential dangers to your body. You don't panic about it. You simply manage what you have in, in those ways, and you reduce it. And in fact, um, with devices in general, 98%, 90, 100% of the problem with devices is when it touches your, your, your body, any part of the body. When you move it one to two foot away, almost 80% of the danger to the cell is, is gone. Just by moving one, two foot away. By four foot, most of it is gone. So by simply taking devices that you're not using and moving them away, you really reduce the exposures. And by the way, as we just spoke, if you're using devices and you're putting them aside, by turning them off, you're reducing the cumulative, the ambient in the environment. So, like in your case, you have a cell phone. You actually have a Wi-Fi transmitter on. You have a cell tower transmitter on. And you may even have a Bluetooth transmitter on. If you're not at home using the cell or the Bluetooth, turn them off. Uh, we often so your so your phone's going to transmit three different. It's not just receiving, but it's transmitting those three signals. Right. Oh, so just shoot. turn them off. So, so for in my case, for example, because there's no cell service here, which is why I moved here, um, I can go ahead, like I can show you, I can turn off on my iPhone, see if we can put that on the camera. Yeah, yeah. I can turn off my cellular service, turn off the Bluetooth and just have the Wi-Fi on my phone. And that way it's only emitting yeah. one of those three signals and I can still get phone calls and text right. using my, my network. Right, exactly. Luke, when we, uh, we last cool. talked, I talked about bees in the room. Uh, one bee won't kill you. A thousand will. So if that, that's analogous to the, the transmitters in a room. If, if you have one transmitter in the room, you're not going to die. If you have a thousand, I'd be worried, worried. So turn them off. By simply turning off within your environment, you're reducing much of the dangers potentially to your body. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Blue Blocks. These guys are changing the game when it comes to blue blocking eyewear. They've got a complete range of evidence-backed blue light blocking glasses to suit your every need. All different shapes and sizes. 
But what's even cooler is they now do prescription and reading glasses with their world-renowned blue blocking lenses. Simply upload your prescription at checkout and they do the rest. Blue Blocks also offers a really epic send in your own frame service. So you can send in some old sunglass frames that you like and they will turn those into blue blockers. You can find all of this at blueblocks.com. That's B L U B L O X. So if you want to protect your eyes, your sleep, your melatonin, your brain, be seen perfectly into your old age, you definitely want to get some Blue Blocks, all right? While you're there, make sure to pick up a Remedy sleep mask. Did you know that light hitting your eyes even when they're closed is enough to raise your blood sugar levels and suppress melatonin? Yeah, that's right. You know when you're in a hotel and like light just sneaks in from everywhere? You can fix that with a Remedy sleep mask. It's got zero eye pressure. It's super comfortable. It's really well designed, very high quality. You can get all of that over at blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X. Enter the code LIFESTYLIST and save 15% off. That's blueblocks.com. And now back to the interview. Uh, electric frequencies coming off the laptop are exponentially higher and more harmful when it's plugged in. Would, yeah. you, would you agree that it, yeah. you want to pre-charge your, your devices, then use And with a laptop, I've heard that the... So we spoke about ELF and RF, right? So you're not only getting the RF transmissions, but you're getting the ELF transmissions. 60 hertz stuffed. The AC, the alternating current within your home is also at play. It's not that it's increasing the RF. It's making multiple sources of emissions, both ELF and RF. And you're right. Simply by taking it, unplugging it, using it with battery, half of those transmissions that can be dangerous to your body are gone by simply unplugging it. Right. And from if you're protecting the bottom of your laptop with a device like like you guys make, um, is there anything you can do about the emissions coming off the keyboard and the trackpad like on a laptop? Or are, are those something of concern anyway? Like would it be optimal to use a like a, a, a wired trackpad or mouse and a wired keyboard and keep your laptop screen even further away from you rather than having your hands like over that? those emissions while you're using it for long periods of time? There's absolutely no question about that. In fact, um, <clears throat> we also often work with extremely hypersensitive, electro hypersensitive people. And for them, we have fairly rigid rules. You have to create a workstation. If you use your laptop the way it is, you're all going to be in chronic um irritation all the time you use it. You have to manage yourself when using the technology. So if you take a new uh, LED monitor and you put it put it to away, the danger of the screen is gone. If you put um, a wired pad versus a wireless pad, you eliminate the Bluetooth. In addition to that, you're putting the source of much of the emission away from you by one or two feet. So you're really reducing the emissions by 80% by simply doing the simple things you suggested. Oh, having a, a wireless, uh, a wired uh, a mouse and a wireless keyboard connected to a tablet or, or a laptop really is important to some of us, more than 20% of us. And it's simple to set up and you really provide a more safe environment for use. Awesome. That's, that's perfect. That's one of the things I've been <laughs> intending to, I don't use a laptop that much, mostly when I travel, but I've been intending yeah. to do that. And even I had uh, Brian Hoyer, the guy I mentioned before, come in and test my whole house, which by the way, guys, well, I'm, it's a two hour documentary that I produce, basically him screening the whole house to teach people uh, what's going on yeah. in there. And that'll probably be out, I think by the time this does. So I'll, I'll plug it in the intro and the outro when your episode comes out. But he came and tested the workstation that I'm in right now, which is a big iMac computer and my microphones and headphones, all the recording equipment. And this was one of the lowest EMF areas of the whole house, which I thought was so interesting because I always thought 
oh, I'm probably getting fried by this giant computer and all <laughs> no. these mics. It's actually pretty good. The only thing that that I could optimize, I think, on this workstation is I'm I'm using the Apple. I'll put it on the camera here for the YouTube video. I'm using the Apple um, trackpad. And when I use this or I use my laptop, and it it might be a nocebo psychosomatic thing too, but I swear my like my right hand gets sore. It like hurts in my bones. No, that's and, it's and it, literally true. That's what you're feeling is true. Oh, okay. Because I, be- I don't want to I don't want to believe that. But um, <laughs> but unfortunately, app, I'm so addicted to the trackpad, I can't use a mouse anymore. It's just so cumbersome, and I, I just can't move quickly and operate my computer with efficiency. And so they've not yet invented, you know, an Apple no. trackpad that's wired, yeah, which was, drives me yeah. nuts. Because otherwise, my little workstation would be really, um, really legit. Yeah, um, all you all your workstation is wired. That's why it's right the way it is. Right. There was a little ELF coming off the back of the iMac, but I'm I'm quite far from it, so it didn't it wasn't an so issue. Pretty safe. If you wanted to be real hardcore, you could put, you know, like shielded power cables on the back of the computer essentially, but it, you know, it's far enough away I didn't trip on that. Uh, another thing I'd like to ask you about is uh, Bluetooth devices that people use on their head. I see people all the time now walking around with these these earbuds, and I just again, like when I see a five year old with an iPad on their belly or something, I just cringe. What What's your opinion on the radiation level of Bluetooth devices on your on your skull? Actually, I was hinting to some of that earlier, so let's talk about that. A standard cell phone shouldn't transmit more than six, 1.6 watts per kilogram. It can't penetrate by, by the standard. It can't really go beyond one inch. If you are concussed and um, you're not a six-foot male, you're a female, for example, that Bluetooth signal is dot three watts. That's five times less than a 1.6 watt signal, dot three watts. What we know from research is that with a concussion, with the blood brain barrier down as a result of the concussion, dot one watts, one third below the level of Bluetooth can disturb the cells of the frontal lobe. So they're crazy to run the risk of using it long term like that. It's it's not that it's moment. If you use it for three minutes, not a big deal. But if you put it in your ears and doing it for hours at a time, it's a constant, constant transmission over a long duration of time. And that's when it becomes dangerous. And yeah. even though it's a low level, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't recommend it. It seems perhaps worse even now because you've got the, the ear buds that go on either side of your brain. So you're, you're, you're creating like this, um, you know, this field that's surrounding your brain. Even the old school little Bluetooth things on your ear would be, uh, you know, just on one side. And for some reason, just having it kind of, you know, the communication, the hemispheric sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, surrounding of your brain with even that low level radiation for, a, f- a three mile jog or going to the gym for right. two hours or sitting in the office and not wanting to hold your cell phone. I'm, I just think, wow, that's, that can't be good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and think of this, um, some actually transmit separately, but not many. Most transmit to one that transmits to the other. Oh, damn. That makes it worse. That's dot three Watts going through your head. Interesting. Okay. And when we're looking at a cell phone, uh, like an iPhone, I guess most people I know have an iPhone, but they all probably work the same. Um, what areas of the phone are provided it's not plugged in? Like again, with the laptop, we would advise to not use your phone when it's plugged in, try to charge your phone and then use it when it's right. plugged into the 60 Hertz, you know, power grid in your house. Um, but in terms of the RF, the radiation, whether it be the, the cellular service, the Wi-Fi, or the Bluetooth, or all of them, which parts of the phone um, directionally produce the worst or the most signal that you'd want to avoid? The top. Really? Yeah, that's where the uh, cell tower communication is occurring, on the top. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth are on the sides. Ah, uh, so the cell service is on the top edge, and then the... 
the other signals come out the side? On the sides. Oh, yeah. interesting. Typically. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, um, we haven't talked about any of this stuff, but you know, when you talk about a cell phone to the head, um, in, in um, telecommunications, it's called cross talk, where I can be talking to you on one telephone line and I hear someone else other than you. That's where one transmission is interfering with another transmission. Well, when you have a transmission to your head, the communications within the head is cross-talking with the communications from your cell phone. So it's not just, and we haven't talked much about it, other than it's thermal and not much biological, but you're actually interfering with bineal glands. There's all sorts of stuff that's interfering with the very low-level communications infrastructures of the body. It's screwing it up. And so um, it's it's not just... Um, am I going to get cancer in the frontal lobe that we're worried about? It's really the interference problems of these signals. And the clinics these days are finding out more and more that there is clear evidence of direct links between cell phones. Like the breast to cancer, there's breast to neurological and physiological changes in the body. Got it. And so with the device that I have uh, that you guys make, the Defender Shield phone case, which, by the way, when I first got it, it has a little wallet in it, you know, where you can put, you know, like a billfold, you have your bills and then credit cards. And when I first got it, I was like, man, I don't want to carry around this big ass thing. It's so clunky. And my credit cards are in there. And um, and I also felt really old. You know, it's like an old dude thing to to <laughs> carry it all in one. And I'm, I'm hanging on to 49 as long as I can. Uh, but you know what's interesting that I found is I actually, now I can't stand carrying a wallet. Like I'll be bummed if one of my credit cards that I, you know, like my business card or whatever is in my wallet somewhere. I'm like, oh God, I just, so now I have them all stuffed in this phone case. And I actually like just having to remember one thing. It's been really kind of actually um, a game changer just in terms of carrying stuff around. But I'm well, glad you like it. Yeah, it's cool. It's a great device. What I'm curious about though is, from what I understand, the shielding part of this case is the part that covers the screen, which is where yes. you, the sound, you know, your speaker is on that side too. Is that correct? Speakers on the uh, on the uh, the earpiece. Okay. And we we go around it. Right. But remember, I told you where the transmitters are. Yeah. They're on the sides. Yeah. So we actually shield it from the sides. So our shielding goes up to the top. So okay. we actually shield. And the speaker, and when you talk, the microphone's on the bottom, and we don't we don't cover that. Right. Um, and so, by the way, I didn't do. I don't know if I told you this, but when I was developing this product, there was a six, sixteen year old girl that wanted a cell phone, and parents finally ended up breaking down and buy it for her, and. Uh, she passed away from frontal lobe cancer a year later. That was the motivation of me building that because I knew the signal could be stopped and no one was stopping it. And a simple device like that stops the signal where it's most dangerous to the body. And, so, and so uh, if you're if you're walking around and you need to have your phone on and not on airplane or turned off, which is the case for most of us, obviously, we want to be yeah. reachable. Um then right. you would carry this phone here in your case with the shielded side, which is the face of your phone, the front of your phone where the screen is. You'd carry that right. facing your body. And then it's still going to be yeah. getting the cellular transmission coming out of yeah. the back of your phone, which is the part of the case that's not shielded, right? Right. That's exactly how it works. Okay. It's that simple. Because if you shielded all four sides with your case, your phone would be non-operational, right? It wouldn't work. <laughs> okay. That's how good the shielding works. Oh, well, that's, that's yeah. good. Okay. So, um, and then I've heard that there's GPS and other things still activated when, even when your phone's on airplane, is, is your phone still producing radiation when it's in airplane mode or is it? Yes. It is. Okay. Yes. And it's even worse. With the new newest stuff, the 11, iPhone 11 and, and other new technologies, they, because they're using slightly different GPS stuff. So it's actually worse now than, than it was a year ago. So, yeah, you have to be aware that when you turn it off and put airplane or you 
It's not turning off all the transmitters, but they're spurious. It's not constant. It's periodic. Got it. Um, and then I'm assuming you, you don't <laughs> find uh, validity or efficacy in these other little crystal stickers and the quantum pads. And, you know, over the years before there was a device like you make that just covers the whole damn thing up. I mean, I don't know how many different, I, in fact, I just found one on the bottom of my trackpad. I have some little Shungite <laughs> sticker thing, you know, and I'm like, hey, it it can't hurt. But I've I've never seen any empirical evidence as to the right. you know the effectiveness of these little stickers and quantum this and that that you stick on the back of your phone or anything. Have you have you ever come across any of those devices that have any positive impact at all, or is it you know hogwash? I, I try to be open about it, but we got to remember I ran technical laboratories for many many years, and so for me, when somebody makes a claim about performance. You test it to see if it did what it says it's going to do. And so many products on the market have no independent, unbiased testing that substantiates the claim. And quite frankly, there are some arguments that are being described about the performance of these some of these devices that defies physics. I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> And then so like you really have to look for, as you just pointed out, some level of evidence that substantiates the claim. So many of them don't. And I would only make an assumption that if, if they don't have a substantiation, I would question the validity of the claim. Right. Yeah, I think that's when you get into the EMF mitigation game, um, it's tricky because there, and I don't know that this is true for the little stickers that go on your phone and that kind of stuff. The, the only evidence I've ever seen that that's doing anything is if you do muscle testing, you know, which is, there's a, a lot of uh, potential for placebo and things like that when you Correct. do muscle testing. In other words, like if you put a sticker on my phone that's supposed to, you know, protect me from the EMF, even though it's not going to affect an EMF meters reading because it's not technically blocking, but let's say it creates a you know harmonious field uh, right. on and around your phone and you tell me that and then I hold the phone against my solar plexus and you muscle test me and I'm weak without it, strong with it. That could be just because I have a strong belief that it's doing something, you know? So right. you, you can't tell. And by the way, that's, that's called indirect. Okay. You can't trust indirect for the very reasons you said. Okay. It's not controlled. Right. Okay. So with the devices, you have that. And then the thing that I find fascinating is, as I mentioned before, I have two different types of devices that are in my home. And um, because it doesn't, technically speaking, block the Wi-Fi in my home, for example, because my Wi-Fi still works when these devices are on. Right. Um, however, I have had my N equals one own personal study in case in the case of the Blue Shield device, which is a scalar wave device, uh, which essentially emits a frequency that is resonant with your body that renders your body um, to some degree impervious to the negative EMF fields because your body's kind of attuning to the positive field, therefore becoming somewhat invisible to the, the negative EMF field. And my evidence with that was when I was living next to those cell towers, I lived there and I didn't know the cell towers were there. I just knew that I felt like shit. And I thought, well, I'm going to put one of these devices in my house because I know I live in the middle of the city and there's, there's EMF around. There's no, reason, there's no need for me to test the levels because I already know there's just ambient radiation in my neighborhood anyway. So I put right. that thing in there. And then once I found the cell towers and moved out, I looked back I was like, holy crap, before I even knew there were cell towers there, those symptoms like the headaches and insomnia and all those yeah. things stopped when I had put that blue shield thing in my house. Yeah, I got yeah. I got worse for about a week. I had some kind of, you know, uh, die off or, you know, kind of a Herxheimer reaction. And that's what they told me it probably was because I said, guys, I feel worse now that this thing's in my house. After a week or two, that subsided and my symptoms went down dramatically and mm -hmm. months later, I put two and two together and I thought, oh my God, that little scalar thing actually did something, even mm -hmm. though you couldn't empirically test that it was, you know, blocking that cell tower next to me. It was doing something. And, and in much the same way, this 
these other devices that are based on not scalar, but on um, precious stones and semi-precious stones that emit a field within your home called the Soma Vedic. Uh, both of those companies do really interesting testing where they do live blood cell analysis. They do yes. HRV analysis before and after. And even Blue Shield's done a couple interesting um, animal studies, which of course is you know impossible to placebo. The animal doesn't have a conscious awareness that you're doing any testing. Right, they right. did these tests in New Zealand where they would um, go to chicken farms and cow farms that were very close to cell towers. And yep. they would test the uh, they would test the milk before and after installing these devices, and um, find that the milk with these devices installed on the property had a much greater nutrient density and fat profile. And then they'd take mm-hmm. it away, and it would go back to being kind of crappy milk. And with the chickens, the same thing. They would um, test the quality and size of the eggs. And they would also um, note the degree of infighting within the coop. And so these chickens that were under the stress of those cell towers would be fighting and picking each other and, and all oh, this yeah. kind of stuff. And then when they installed the devices, there was just like peace in the chicken coop, you know, <laughs> and they documented all this. And so I, I, I find those technologies interesting, but I still am, I'm a bit woo woo, but I also like a, a dose of science and empirical evidence right. here and there. But I find both of those interesting because they are able to do testing outside of the direct realm of saying, okay, this blocks EMF like your devices do yeah. on your cell right. phone, your tablet, your um, your um, uh, laptop, et cetera. So I'm, I'm encouraged that these companies are seeing on a marketplace need yeah. and coming up with technologies that they can verify at least to some degree are having a positive effect, even though they don't interfere with your ability to use those devices by technically blocking it all. So- Right. There's kind of a middle ground, I think, between the little fake stickers that don't do anything and just having yeah, everything exactly. blocked. You know, there's there's some in the energetic kind of quantum field, there seem to be things emerging that are useful, which is exciting. And Luke, that's why I said right from the very beginning when we started chatting about this, I don't make an assumption that it doesn't work because there are some things like, for example, um, some of the stones, they're fundamentally carbon. Carbon is a, it, it absorbs the, uh, the emissions, believe it or not. So they're like a f- floating ground. And so there's very legitimate scientific evidence of what it can do, but they just don't realize what it is or they can't explain it. So there's a lot of stuff that I see going on that is good stuff um, that does have um, a, a good market that has the need and i think we should find out what they are and test them out yeah likewise well i think between the two you know a lot of the strategies we've talked about today there's there's a lot you can do and i also appreciate your perspective that it's important that we don't get bogged down in the fear and anxiety and run around with veins full of cortisol and adrenaline because we're terrified (laughs) of our environment because i think and, and i i tend to be on that the spectrum some sometimes. And so, you know, I find myself being afraid of these fields and all that stuff because I have perhaps a mild PTSD of getting so ill from being next to them. I'm like, God, I never want to feel like that again. So it's sort of a balance, um, as I said earlier, of having awareness of these things and doing what you can and mitigating and kind of set it and forget it and live your life. Because it's, it's probably worse for your health to walk around in anxiety with these stress hormones flooding your body than it is just, you know, having a Wi-Fi router on, you know? You know, it's funny you said PTSD because what we know with the extremely hypersensitive, which is the under, uh, the worst side of the spectrum, there's always the fear. It's literally psychological that it builds up in your mind. And so it's really something that you need to overcome in a sense because it's really true. The body set up to protect itself. And so when there's a environment and you suspect it could be a problem, it is a problem because you're psychologically trying to deal with it. Yeah. So it's interesting you said that. Yeah. It's, well, it's, you know, it's, I've been really into the work of uh, uh, Bruce Lipton and Joe Dispenza and these guys that are, you know, yeah. into 
changing your biology using intention and, you know, entering yeah. into the quantum field and, and working with things like that. And I've interviewed both of them about this issue particularly, and they, they both kind of gave me the affirmative uh, kind of answer that I just arrived at that is like, A, protect yourself whenever possible. B, don't be a victim of your limbic system and walk around paranoid because that's even worse for you, you know? Exactly. So exactly. Um, I'm actually doing a program right now called DNRS that was developed by a woman named Annie Hopper who suffered from severe chemical and EMF sensitivities and learned uh, this process of, well, learned and developed a process of using neuroplasticity to heal the limbic system of its injuries, which happens throughout your life from various forms of trauma that put you in that perpetual fight or flight state and this state of being, you know, on constant on a cortisol and adrenaline cycle. And so uh, through that system, she gets people that are very sensitive to become unsensitive and in some cases render them completely impervious to the effects of EMF and chemicals and things like that by healing the limbic system, which is fascinating. So that's kind of my next, my next venture into, you know, moving out of the anxiety and fear. But that said, I'm, I'm still going to have a defender shield on my phone under my laptop. I'm going to turn my wife off at night. You know, I'm not going yeah, to live simple stuff to do, you know, so it's kind of a combination of both. I think the, 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 the mentality of it and your attitude toward it and, you know, loosening up a bit and just taking the, the, uh, you know, the simple approach of just mitigating what you can. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I like that story you're telling because we are finding that I, I, I work with clinics and um, we're finding that the cell phones, the ambient, our ambient has picked up a thousand times over the last 15 years. And so we see all these kids in school that having uh, anger problems, uh, more ADHD, all those kinds of things that are happening in our environment. And what they're finding is it's the brain that's actually appears to be being influenced in all this. And so yeah, it was characterized by one neurologist with me is you're walking and your brain's sleeping. In other words, the brain patterns are mis screwed up. So when you're in bed, you're not healing. And when you're up, you're trying to heal. And so it's it's becoming more and more complicated with the presence of these electronics in our in our environment. And the way in which you deal with it has to be different. And so the first thing I thought about is um, when you were mentioning that is that um, they have brain tap and other forms of uh, uh, systems that actually help the brain realign itself to where it needs to be. And we have things like Wavi, which is actually measuring the electrical resistance in parts of the brain. So you know you're gaining or losing in the clinic environment. So a lot of people are working on a lot of very important things in this true new space, which, by the way, I, I think more is the elephant in the room than ever before. It's pretty serious stuff. Yeah, I love that you mentioned brain tap. I recently met those guys and got one of those devices. It's a kind of a neural reprogramming, yeah. brain healing, meditation, earphone yeah. light show thing. It's it's very cool. I actually I did one last night, and it has yeah. That's Doctor Porter. I yeah. love the guy. He's, oh yeah, he's, he's been doing it for thirty years. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to interviewing him. But yeah, I love the brain tap. Last night I was listening to one about uh, manifesting wealth and stuff. You know, because a lot of his programs have guided visualizations and things, and it puts you yes. in this theta state where you're very programmable yeah. and puts you in a position to use neuroplasticity to reprogram you. And so he'll do yeah. these guided visualizations and meditations while you're under that state and kind of imprint you in almost a hypnotherapeutic uh, fashion yeah. to take on new beliefs and to let go of old ones. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Very by by the way, that's how they've improved the ADHD response wow. of the body. It's hypersensitive. That's how they did it. Wow. I've seen it actually change. Oh, that's so cool. Exciting stuff. And by the way, by the time yeah. this comes out, guys, I should have, in addition to the Defender Shield projects, uh, pro, uh, products, I should have the brain tap on my store, lukestory.com forward slash store. Uh, speaking of store, I appreciate your time today. And we've 
done a good job, I think, of sharing information with people without trying to slang products to them. But I love the products that you guys make. So I'd like to just open the floor now for you to just, you know, give us a rundown of your product line, what devices they fit on, where they can find them and things like that. Well, as I said, we started with a laptop shield, the Defender Pad. It was done because I wanted to protect my sons and have grandchildren, which, by the way, I don't have grandchildren yet, seven years later. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for nothing, boys. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But I know they have their good sperm count. And so, uh, but then we, I told you the story about the 16-year-old girl. That pushed me into the cell phone space. I was really frustrated. It's It was it was anecdotal, but it really, for some reason, drove home the need to try to do something about it. So we went into the cell phone. Um, ever since that time, we've kept on expanding our product lines where we have earphones, earbuds. Um, we have headsets coming out for the uh, autistic. Um, we're, we're trying to create environmental emf free products uh for for uh for all people not just kids and but adults as well and so we have a full product line there going um i'm a little sensitive to the we talked about um you would actually this would actually work for you we have a blanket we sell it's actually a grounded shield it's oh, a floating I, I got shield. one of those. I got one of those. Yeah, I've been taking it on the airplane. You, you will feel different from it because you're sensitive. And it really calms your body down. So I didn't make it for you, by the way. I made it for protecting w- women who are pregnant <laughs> because I know the womb is so vulnerable. And But I found out later on that it really helps the body in general feel uh, more calm and it provides protection. Um, we have sleeves, we have pouches, we have all sorts of different things. We're trying to build for the everyday use. Um, if you want to look really older, like you're about 65 years old, we have a clip that you can put on the side of your, <laughs> on your belt. That'll do it. <laughs> that, yeah, that's we have all sorts of things. That's where we're going. That's my next step. You know, when you when you really throw in the towel, I think once I can get away with that. Once I I lock in a wife and settle down, you know, then I'll then I'll pull that out. Now I it might be premature. Well, a year or two from now, I'll give you a buzz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, that's great, man. Listen, I you know I appreciate um, appreciate the work you're doing in the world, and I appreciate when people make products that actually work. So kudos to you and your team for Thank that. You. Uh, in closing, I'd love for you to share three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life or work that our listeners might be able to go learn something from as well. Um, I have a teaching. Um, life is pretty precious. You don't realize it when you're living it. Um, so I always talk about look at where what you'll be thinking about on your deathbed. When you're on your deathbed, what's going to be important? Is uh, Luke's podcast going to be important? Is the I work represented uh, the telephone industry with the FCC every so often. I thought that was really important. Believe it or not, it's not very important. There's not a lot of things that are important that are truly important to you. And so this is a ride we take. Um, it, it's a journey that takes stone and but there's certain very important relationships you build in that journey and cherish them because that's what you're going to think about on your deathbed. Um, to me, that was like pretty important. And it's it's not theory for me. So uh, you really want to see it as helpful hint at how you should think about your lifestyle. Um, that's probably probably the most important thing in my mind. And it boils down to very simple. Be aware of the life you're living and where you're going and make sure it's where you want to go. Love it, dude. Thank you. And uh, give us the URL of your website, social media handles and all that stuff. Defendershield.com. That's Defendershield.com. And that's where we have not only products, but Luke, we spend a lot of time educating as well. We have a learning section about 5G, for example, 
No one else has this stuff. We try to help people understand it. In fact, you don't ever have to buy a product from me. I don't care. But you should read and understand what it is your environment is. Because the more you understand, the more you control. And so we have a learning section. We have the products under DefenderShield.com. Um, we offer our products through Amazon, if that's where you prefer. Uh, but um, if you ever need help, give us a buzz. We spend a lot of time having a staff of experts that can really answer all your questions about electromagnetic radiation. And I used to answer the phone all the time. I could never get off because there'd be finally someone who can help them understand their environment. It's not a time to panic. It's a time to understand. Um, it's environmental. And we need to understand environment all of our lives. So if you need to questions about any subject outside of our products, that's fine. Give us a buzz. Cool, man. At DefenderShield.com. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for enlightening me and our audience. And I look forward to talking to you again. Luke, thanks so much for inviting me again. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Well, folks, we made it through another episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining me and Daniel on this very fun and informative episode. Man, every time I do one of these interviews, I learn so much. And you might have guessed if you're a regular listener of this show that I, I, as much as I'm in this for you, I'm in it for me. I really want to know the answers to these questions, such as that one where I was asking him, what's the difference with the 5G network that's rolling out to basically exterminate half the population in the next few years and the 5G that you see on your Wi-Fi router because I've always been confused about that and that's something I would ask an expert just privately if I ran into someone that knew so I, I just feel so privileged to be able to talk to all these brilliant people not only for myself but then to have you guys as a uh, well a bunch of flies on the wall listening to these conversations so thank you for indulging me in my passions and things that I'm just uh, committed to learning about. So I really appreciate you and I appreciate you supporting the show and our sponsors and all that. And uh, I mentioned it in the intro, but I'll give it to you again. If you guys want to check out some of Daniel's products, and you know, I'm always hesitant to like plug guest stuff, but I use it and I think it's awesome. I have his cell phone case sitting right here and the laptop case in the other room and all that. And I know sometimes people listening are like, oh, damn, I want to try that stuff. Uh, is there a discount? Well, yes, there is. You get 20% off at DefenderShield.com by using the code LIFESTYLIST. So that's DefenderShield.com. The code is LIFESTYLIST and you save 20% off. Again, join the newsletter, man. The new show notes are badass. They're very detailed. They've got timestamps and you're going to get them sent to you every Tuesday. Go to LukeStory.com forward slash newsletter. That's LukeStory.com forward slash newsletter. Or you can text the word LIFESTYLIST only on a US phone, by the way. Text the word lifestylist, all one word, to the number 44222. And all that's going to happen is you're going to enter your name and email. And every Tuesday and sometimes Friday, I'm going to send you all of the links to everything we talk about in each episode, along with very detailed time stamped now. These are the new show notes um, that you know let you jump to different parts in the conversation that interest you. It's really cool. I love when podcasts I listen to really take time to make quality detailed notes. And I recently stepped those up. Uh, when I stepped those up, by the way, and produced transcripts and also bought a bunch of new video equipment and video editing and all this, my expenses went up. So please support my sponsors. That brings us to uh, where the money comes in because uh, daddy's got to pay for this show, kids. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so let's thank Juve. Let me see. Did I use my Juve today? Goddamn right I did. Yep. I did about a 15 minute session this morning before I hopped in the uh, hyperbaric chamber, did an ice bath uh, before I went over to a yoga class at Wanderlust, which is fantastic. Great way to start the day. So the Juve red light therapy, it's a game changer. Uh, I even recently, well, I don't know if I tricked her, but I encouraged my girlfriend to start using the Juve because it's so good for you and it's so easy to use. You just freaking stand there and maybe stretch a little bit. Uh, but I, I sold her on some of the benefits, I think, such as um, increased collagen production, which means a number of different things. Uh, one of them being, you know, blemishes, wrinkles, skin elasticity, and actually the thickness of your skin increases with, with red light therapy because 
uh, you synthesize collagen, which is a protein uh, your skin's made of mostly, uh, better. And also mitochondrial function and health and energy. Red light therapy is one of the most scientifically validated alternative therapies or biohacks in the world. There's literally thousands of papers to support the efficacy of red light therapy. And the best guys in the business, in my opinion, are my friends at juve.com. That's J-O-O-V-V.com. And if you go to juve.com forward slash Luke and enter the code Luke at checkout, they send you some kind of free bonus gift. I don't even know what it is because I've never placed an order myself, but it's probably cool. So go to juve.com forward slash Luke. Next up, we've got natural stacks. And uh, oh yeah, today, actually, before I recorded, I took some NeuroFuel, the uh, you know natural stacks flagship nootropic product. And I emptied about four capsules into the blender and some water and uh, drank that stack so that I could record these intros and outros uh, with greater uh, success. <laughs> because sometimes if my brain's a little sleepy, such as tonight, it's 930, uh, I would have a hard time doing that. I would fumble a lot. And uh, Natural Stacks NeuroFuel has the precursors to your neurotransmitters, which help with cognition and brain function. So they're really cool. They also make my favorite magnesium. It's called MagTech. Check that out. So go to naturalstacks.com forward slash Luke. The code is Luke Story, and that's going to save you 15% off. And their products are also really affordable, by the way, at Natural Stacks. They are not shysters. They're very fair price. And I think NeuroFuel, to be honest, is probably... The most affordable and effective nootropic or, well, it's not a smart drug because it's all plant-based. It's just natural stuff, but um, it works like a smart drug. It makes you hella smart. Naturalstacks.com forward slash Luke. And lastly, my friends over at Blue Blocks. And funnily enough, I don't do this on purpose, you guys. I'm just, I'm not a shill for shit that I don't like. Um, I have my Blue Blocks on right now. And those of you watching on Instagram Live can attest to that fact. I, I'm, I'm not a phony. I really use these things. Uh, Blue Blocks make a ton of really cool blue blocking glasses and eyewear. They also make a great sleep mask and uh, they do prescription glasses, reading glasses, the whole shebang. So go to blueblocks.com. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. And you can save yourself 15% off using the code LIFESTYLIST. So I want to give a you know big thanks to you and to our sponsors without whom this show would just not happen, man. It's expensive. It costs a few thousand dollars a month to run a podcast with full video and show notes and social media and all the all the things that I do uh, to produce you know, what I hope to be one of the best podcasts out there. We've surpassed 4 million downloads for which I am just eternally grateful to you, the listeners. I want to encourage you to not only support our sponsors, uh, but if you can't do that, just sharing the episode with friends. I see you guys all the time on the Instagram stories. My Instagram is at Luke Story. Uh, I don't 100% of the time repost your story, uh, especially if it, you know, to be honest, if it if it's not that creative looking, I don't repost it. But sometimes people will do like a screenshot of the show or just make a comment about an episode. And, you know, they put some copy on there, some some little, I don't know if they're called GIFs or GIFs. No one, no one can give me a conclusive answer on that. So I'm just going to say GIF GIFs. If your stories are super cool, I'll probably repost them and you know tag you and stuff and maybe get you a couple followers if, if that's something that interests you. But um, the most important thing is I just want to say I really appreciate you helping to promote this podcast because it's my goal. I mean, 4 million downloads is awesome. And I'm usually in the top 100, if not the top 50 uh, in the health category in iTunes for whatever that's worth. But man, I really want to see the show in the top 10. You know what I mean? Uh, I would like to get up to 10 million downloads this year in 2020. And only you honestly can help me do that by just texting this show to a couple friends, sharing it on social media, etc. And if you don't want to do any of that shit, it's all good. Just subscribe and tune in next week where I will be delivering to you another great episode of this show. Thank you so much for listening. Peace. Peace.